So there are three types of muscle contractions. One is isometric, in terms of the muscle producing force and to the loads the muscle. Force is equal to load in isometric. And force is greater than load for concentric. And then in eccentric contraction, force is smaller than load. For example, you are standing up from a chair, your force is greater than your body mass. But when you are sitting the chair slowly, your force is smaller than body mass. So we are performing eccentric contractions every day. It is not a strange exercise at all. So in this particular lecture, uh, eccentric exercise is defined as exercise mainly consisting of eccentric muscle contractions. So these are typical eccentric exercises, going down the slope, nose hamstring exercise, uh, sit up, but actually we are lowering the body down to the floor. This is a more eccentric contraction. Um, uh, Push-ups, you are going down to the floor, is the eccentric. And also dumbbell, you are lowering the dumbbell. So these are eccentric exercises. So the special eccentric exercises are eccentric cycling. This is a special bicycle, you have the motor inside, then crank is going backwards. But each time uh, that uh, this person is resisting, then eventually it's going backward, but each time uh, knee extensors are stretched during this exercise. Okay, so there are some characteristics for eccentric exercise. So this is a uh, typical force velocity relationship. Compared to the isometric uh, maximal force, in eccentric contraction can produce more force than isometric, and then much greater than concentric force for the eccentric. For example, for elbow flexor uh, curl, this is dumbbell curl, the uh, average concentric RM is about 15 kilograms, and then for eccentric, about 20 kilograms. So 38% greater strength we can produce during eccentric contraction and concentric. This is also the case for leg press. So you can see many plates here. This is about 600 to 700 kilograms. Then this is a, a rugby athlete. He cannot push this weight. This is about 1,000 kilograms. But he can lower this weight. So in this particular study, we found that uh, Malaysian rugby sevens players, they can do concentric RM for 600 kilograms, but eccentric RM for about 1,000 kilograms, which is 60% greater than concentric RM. So eccentric contraction has a greater capacity to produce greater force. In this particular study, published in 1952, they compared between the concentric and eccentric cycling. So one person is going forward, normal cycling, other person is going backwards, which is eccentric cycling. When compared between the eccentric and concentric cycling, for the same uh, oxygen consumption, uh, work was much greater for eccentric con uh, cycling, and also the, for the same work, Eccentric cycling required much, much less oxygen in comparison to concentric cycling. So we did a study using a little bit more than eccentric and concentric cycling machines. So for the same work, about 160 watts, which is still some maximum eccentric contraction, about 30% of MVC. During eccentric cycling, oxygen consumption is 50% lower than concentric cycling and heart rate was about 20% lower during eccentric cycling than concentric. When the same eccentric cycling repeated two weeks later, still oxygen consumption is 50% lower, and the heart rate is much lower, 30% lower. So definitely eccentric exercise, in this case, eccentric cycling is less metabolically demanding than concentric cycling for the same workload. So this is due to less muscle activity during eccentric and concentric cycling. For the same work during eccentric cycling, much less muscle activity for the vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, also rectus femoris, and also biceps femoris compared to the concentric cycling. 
So we recruit less muscle motor, uh, less muscle fibers during eccentric cycling than concentric cycling. It is interesting that eccentric cycling is more difficult even after a lot of training in comparison to concentric cycling. In this particular study, target workload was 228 watt, and heart rate is, of course, much lower for eccentric cycling than concentric. Then eccentric cycling repeated after some training session as well. So they are getting used to the eccentric cycling uh, in the ECC2 here. So then we assessed uh, error from the target uh, talk. Then eccentric cycling has more error than concentric cycling for the target talk, about 30% error for the first eccentric exercise bout. And after training, still 20% error occurred, which is much greater than 10% error for the concentric cycling. And then we measured the reaction time during cycling. In the concentric cycling, about 600, milli, 600 milliseconds for the reaction time, but eccentric cycling, it was delayed about 700 milliseconds. Then reaction error occurred more during eccentric cycling. This indicates that eccentric cycling is more difficult, which could mean that cognitive demand is much greater during eccentric than concentric cycling. So eccentric exercise is more difficult. For example, when you are walking down the stairs, you need more vigilant attention than uh, going up. One of the negative aspects of eccentric exercise could be muscle damage. This slide showed comparison between eccentric and concentric cycling for strength loss and delayed onset muscle soreness. Uh, after the eccentric cycling, strength loss is greater, then recovered very slow. But after the concentric cycling, uh, strength loss is much smaller, then back to normal very quickly. However, if the same eccentric cycling was repeated two weeks later, strength recovery was much faster, back to normal very quickly. And muscle soreness was also developed only after first bout of eccentric cycling, but second bout of eccentric did not induce any soreness. So, prolonged loss of muscle strength and delayed onset muscle soreness, it is called DOMS, are peculiar to accustomed eccentric exercise. These are considered to be the symptoms of muscle damage. But these symptoms are attenuated or reduced when the same exercise is repeated, which is called repeated bout effect. So indicator muscle damage include delayed onset of muscle soreness and loss of muscle function. Something we can see muscle become stiff and also some swollen muscle, muscle is swollen here. And then these are the typical signs of inflammation. And then uh, pain, immobility, swelling occur after eccentric exercise. Also, other indicator of muscle damage is increasing uh, blood markers, such as creating kinase and myoglobin. And also we can uh, image uh, damage by ultrasound, uh, showing increasing echo intensity or MRI, increasing T2 reaction time. Direct marker muscle damage is, of course, histological changes. So in the myofilament level, we can see Z-line streaming. Also in a myofiber level, we can see sometimes uh, uh, damaged fiber inflated by mononuclear cells. And also we can see some damage or inflammation to the endometrium. So these are direct marker muscle damage. So in this particular study from Denmark, uh, participants performed 210 maximal voluntary eccentric contraction. Also other leg performed maximal eccentric contraction with electrical stimulation. So when comparing between the two conditions, only the muscles received electrical stimulation during maximal voluntary contraction showed indication of muscle fiber damage. About 15% muscle fiber damage for this electrical stimulated condition, but no muscle fiber damage was observed after maximal voluntary eccentric contractions. And then this rapid G line was much greater for this electrical stimulated condition. The no damage occurred for the maximal voluntary contraction. Interestingly, 
no significant differences between voluntary contraction and electrical estimated con uh, conditions for muscle soreness. Really strange because the muscle fiber are more damaged in this case, but muscle soreness is very similar between the two. And then they reported that much greater strength loss for voluntary contraction condition than stimulated condition. So this indicates that histological changes do not necessarily represent symptoms of muscle damage, which are loss of muscle function and dumps. So maybe this is a limitation for the uh, uh, biopsy because uh, we are getting very small sample, but at least we can say uh, histological changes may not be representing symptoms of muscle damage. So for eccentric exercise, if the intensity is higher, more damage occurs, number of the potential greater, more damage, fast velocity eccentric contraction induces more damage than slow velocity, and when muscle length is long uh, for the eccentric contraction, it induces more damage. It comes to the muscle, our muscles have more damage than leg muscles, and for age, children have not so much muscle damage, but adults have more damage, and the young one has more damage than old people. And gender difference exists. Normally, male has more damage than female participants because female has estrogen, which can protect uh, muscle membrane damage. And also, the, uh, if uh, someone is preconditioning for eccentric exercise, or they have a eccentric training, much, much less damage than who don't have those preconditioning or training before the eccentric exercise. So this is called repeated body effect. So out of, about of exercise confers protective effect against muscle damage in subsequent part of the same exercise. So in this case, elbow flexor eccentric exercise, first bout of exercise uh, decreased our strength a lot, then very slow recovery. But four weeks later, without any training, subject repeat the same exercise, much quicker recovery of strength, much quicker recovery of range of motion, much less swelling after the second bout, no increase in CK and myoglobin after the second bout, also less soreness. This is called repeated bout effect. So this effect, repeated bout effect, this is a, a when the participant performed the 100% uh, eccentric exercise twice, then CK is protected about 100%, so it means a no increase after the second bout. DOMC is also protected about 80 to 90 percent, so only small amount of muscle soreness developed after the second bout. Strength was still occurred, but uh, recovery is much faster, and overall about 40 percent protection. But interestingly, if you are performing some maximal eccentric exercise for the first bout, then performing the 100 percent maximal eccentric exercise for the second bout, still we have some protective effect. So the greater the intensity of the first bout, greater the uh, protective effect, but still like a 10% or 20% very low intensity eccentric contractions can have some protective effect. Even um, you are performing uh, long muscle length isometric contraction, you can have some protective effect. That's why uh, athletes don't have so much damage. This is the data from basketball. So this is the Brazil National Female Basket Championship for the last match of that season, most important match. The team we followed won the championship. So after this championship match, uh, we measure some uh, muscle damage indicators. So the basketball, the average time for play is only less than uh, 20 minutes. Then RPE during that match is uh, four, not so high. And then increase in CK and myoglobin is very small. And soreness did not occur so much. This is 20 out of 100. And mm -hmm. also the leg press and bench press did not show any changes after the match. And also the agility test did not show any changes. So it means that the muscle damage was very minor after basketball match which was very, very hard. But uh, in the theory, they can play basketball match every day because there are no muscle damage occurred after basketball. For tennis, a little bit different. 
this is a study uh, from uh, Brazil Tennis Academy Young Tennis Players. So they played three hours on the hard court, and uh, switching the players every one hour. Then they did, they worked very hard for three hours. And then we saw muscle soreness occurred one day after the uh, match, but which is 18 out of 100 scale, which is very mild muscle soreness. CK increased a little bit, but not so much. Myoglobin also did not show any large increase. And one of them, uh, squat strength decreased about 35% immediately post tense match, and still 10% decrease at one day post match. Squat jump and counter movement also decrease uh, immediately after match, and then still some decrease remaining at one day post match. So this means that when they are asked to play the second match, one day post match, then they may not be able to perform very well because they have some reduction in the leg strength and also jump performance decrease and those other things is also happening. So we need to consider the recovery strategy for these athletes to play better in the second and third and fourth matches. This is for soccer. In this particular study, uh, they compared between uh, players without any gain and player in the match, the full play the match. So compare uh, between the uh, uh, players. So exercise players uh, showed decrease in vertical jump height, also decrease in bat, uh, squat strength, and also the uh, increase in the uh, 20 meter sprint time. So their performance getting worse after the match and also a lot of development of dumps. But these are not shown by the uh, control group who did not have a match. So it takes about at least three days to recover to the uh, baseline. So in a soccer match, um, they cannot play in the same level of match for three days. So they need to wait at least three days to recover, even for the well-trained athletes. So ideally, maybe uh, they can play next match four days later or even one week later. So we need to consider the recovery strategy for those athletes. So it is very important for athletes to do uh, eccentric training because in uh, uh, team sports or all the other sports, a lot of eccentric contractions are performed. When they are stopping and changing the direction and uh, trying to prevent falling, they do a lot of eccentric contraction. The more eccentric contractions they perform in a match, more strength loss occurred, power loss occurred, and also that could affect endurance. We found that the uh, athletes who perform more eccentric contraction in the match, they, uh, their performance, especially for the endurance performance, decreased toward the end of their match. And then eventually their performance decreases, then they could suffer from muscle damage in the next days. That's why we need to do eccentric training for these athletes to improve their muscle function and then muscle strength. Then eventually we can create muscle adaptation to improve their performance. So eccentric strength training is very important for athletes. So this review uh, article uh, suggested that eccentric training can improve muscle mechanical function to, to a greater extent than other modalities, such as concentric or eccentric uh, combination training. And the eccentric training may be especially beneficial in enhancing strength, power, and speed performance. Other review article also show that strength training uh, with accentuated eccentric muscle contraction, so leave overload the eccentric training, shows small to large sizes, size effects on change of the direction, speed, performance in athletes. So in order to improve their performance, eccentric training seems to be very important. So we did a study in Malaysia uh, collaboration with the Rugby 7th Malaysian national team. So they did leg press eccentric training for six weeks for the first period, and then they had a Ramadan, week, a Ramadan break for six weeks, and then they had a three-week eccentric training again after the Ramadan break before the uh, actual match. So in the first six weeks, we gradually increased the intensity from 75% to 100% to one concentric maximum. So still some maximal eccentric contractions. And then 
we saw increase in strengths, eccentric strengths about 27% for the uh, T1 to T2, and concentric strength. They did only eccentric strength training, but concentric strength also increased about 15%. When they stopped the training, still they are doing some rugby training, but no resistance training at all. Then we can see reduction of the strengths, but very minor. Only 6% reduction in the eccentric strengths and about 10% decrease in concentric strengths. Then when they did supramaximal eccentric training, still this is not maximal eccentric strengths, but uh, close to it. And then 130% is about close to the eccentric max. Then we saw 22% increase in eccentric strengths from T3 to T4, and also 16% increase in strengths, uh, uh, concentric strengths as well. As overall, we have large increase in eccentric strengths and also concentric strengths as well. And also we found that their speed, agility improved a lot, and then they have less injury. So because of that, they won the Southeastern Asian uh, game in 2017. So uh, I assume that eccentric training contribute to this win, at least a little bit. So is training, um, eccentric training, is very effective for improving cycling performance. As you know, cycling is a concentric uh, exercise, a lot of concentric contractions. So when we are doing eccentric training for the cyclists, whether that is good for them or not. So considering the specificity, eccentric training may not be good for the concentric exercise. However, when we are doing this kind of eccentric cycling, then uh, in this particular uh, exercise, it is possible to cycle 300 to 500 watts at 70 to 80 RPM, but heart rate is not so high, they can handle this one. Then we found that eccentric cycling training appeared to be very effective to improve cycling performance of road cyclists and also, of course, track cyclists. This is other study, but they did a two weeks of a, a, a twice a week for eight weeks of periodized eccentric or concentric cycling training. And this is the interval training. Then we found that uh, peak power, concentric power max increased more for the eccentric training group than concentric. VO2 max increased more for the concentric training than eccentric. But other parameters, strengths, jump performance, pa uh, improved better for the eccentric cycling training than concentric. This is a kayak uh, study. So kayakers performed high intensity eccentric only resistance training, and other group performed eccentric or concentric more traditional training for bench press, bench row, and chin ups, three times a week for eight weeks. Then we found that the uh, group who did eccentric training only showed improvement of the kayak performance, but not for the concentric eccentric training group. And all of the uh, strength measures improved better for the eccentric only training. So is muscle damage necessary? So uh, muscle damage is getting less and less over the training because of the repeated bad effect but muscle hypertrophy occurring toward the end of the training session. So muscle damage is not the process that mediate or potentiate resistance training induced muscle hypertrophy. So in order for the muscle hypertrophy to occur, a lot of signaling pathways are important, especially the P76S6 kinase. But this study showed that maximal eccentric contraction are more effective than maximal concentric contractions in stimulating protein synthesis. Then it may be that mediated through a combination of the greater tension uh, during eccentric contraction or stretching the muscle. So eccentric exercise or eccentric contraction is very important for muscle hypertrophy. So just some uh, simplify this one. Even concentric contraction can increase uh, muscle hypertrophy, but eccentric contraction could have better stimulus. But if muscle damage occurs more, then that could uh, increase protein degradation, which may not be good for the hypertrophy. So we need to maximize eccentric exercise, but minimize muscle damage. 
that is the best strategy. So just switching the topic to a little bit more health. So uh, with aging, uh, we have decrease in muscle mass. So this is 25 years old uh, man for the thigh muscles, 65 much less muscle mass. Then that can lead to decrease in muscle function and if it can lead to increase in fatigue and increase in falling risks. Then because of that, some people reduce physical activities. Then this is a vicious cycle. Sarcopenia occurs more, then muscle function decreases more. But that can lead to the whole body effect because of the muscle mass decreases, energy consumption decreases, bone mineral density could decrease, stimulus to the brain decrease, and then metabolic syndrome increases, insulin resistance increases, and risk of coronary heart disease increases. Everything is starting from sarcopenia. So muscle mass decrease is a, a large effect on the whole body. Skeletal muscle dysfunction causes many chronic diseases. That's why it is very important to maintain and improve skeletal muscles. Then, not only walking, but resistance training is necessary. But in order to do resistance training, we need to consider muscle contraction type. So in this particular study, we compared between the concentric only, like a heel laser exercise, and also the other leg is performing concentric eccentric contraction. So raising the heels together for the both legs, only one leg is going down to the eccentric contraction. So we found that the leg performed concentric and eccentric contraction showed increase in strength, increase in uh, range of motion, and also increase in muscle thickness of the gastrocnemius muscle. But this did not occur for the concentric on the leg. So this suggests that eccentric uh, including uh, eccentric contraction is very important to improve muscle function and also muscle mass. In this particular study, uh, we recruited 26 healthy elderly men, then divided them into two groups. One group did eccentric exercise of the knee extensors, gradually increased the intensity. Other group performed concentric only exercise for the knee extensors, starting from a little bit higher intensity because there's no risk for the uh, muscle damage. They performed only once a week training for 12 weeks. So then we didn't see any indication of muscle damage even from eccentric training group. Then we found that volume strength increased more for the eccentric training group than concentric, and then maximum isometric strength of the knee extensor increased more for the eccentric than concentric. Chair stand ability improved more for the eccentric than concentric. And then eight foot up and go. This agility test improved better for the eccentric than concentric. One leg stance test improved better for the eccentric than concentric. Also, we found that resting glucose, resting insulin, or indicator of insulin sensitivity improved better for the eccentric training group than concentric. And then triglyceride, total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol decreased more for the eccentric training group than concentric and HDL cholesterol increased only for the uh, eccentric training group. So everything was better for eccentric and concentric training. This is a, a stair walking study. So in this particular study, we recruited 30 elderly obese women. So one group did ascending stair walking, just going up the stairs for the first row at the sixth row, then came back by elevator. Descending stair walking group went to the sixth floor by elevator, then they came back by stairs. This is descending stair walking group. So this is a, a very slow movement, only one step per second. Both groups walked very slowly. Then first week they did two reps, and then last week they did 12, 24 reps. In order to do the 24 reps, descending or ascending stair walking, it took about 60 minutes. But this is an interval exercise. So about 12 minutes rest between. So uh, everybody did uh, exercise uh, completed. And then during the exercise, RP was much lower for descending cell walking than ascending, but both are very low because of very slow movement. Heart rate during exercise much lower for the descending than ascending. Historic pressure after the uh, exercise was lower for the descending, the ascending. Then 
we measured many things before and after training period. So after the training, we saw similar decrease in body mass, uh, also body fat, and then body uh, bone mineral density increased only for the ascending stair walking group, uh, so descending stair walking group. And then resting heart rate and resting blood pressure decreased more for the descending than ascending stair walking group. Uh, muscle strength, uh, maximum voluntary contraction strength, chair stand ability, six minutes walking ability, and balance improve better for the ex, uh, descending than ascending stair walking group. And then insulin sensitivity and blood lipid profile improve better for the descending than ascending stair walking group. So even easier exercise, which is descending stair walking, um, induced, uh, produced better health benefit, also fitness improvement. So uh, this is a heart failure and skeletal muscle. So in the heart failure condition, left ventricular dysfunction occurs, then that can uh, increase muscle wasting because of less activity. For example, uh, lots of muscle mass decrease with uh, chronic wasting diseases, including heart fa uh, failure. Then skeletal muscle is affected, then uh, skeletal muscle dysfunction can increase the vascular resistance, then left vas vas uh, ventricular dysfunction occurs more. It's a vicious cycle. So we need to think about how we can improve skeletal muscle function without stressing the heart so much. So we need to think about a lot of exercise, but less fatigue. So we need to think about personalized exercise prescription. This could be done by eccentric exercise, eccentric cycling. In fact, we are doing eccentric cycling study for chronic heart failure patient. He is very skinny but he's doing this eccentric cycling uh, twice a week to see his improvement of the muscle function and also his heart function. This is still going study. But we have completed the study about COPD patient, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patient. So in this particular study, one uh, group did eccentric cycling, other group did concentric cycling for the same uh, RPE. So first week, is, then second week, RPE is 10, third week, RPE is 11, fourth week, RPE is 12, and then rest of the week, RPE is 13 for 12 weeks. So as you can see, much greater work was performed in eccentric cycling than concentric cycling. Then during eccentric cycling, heart rate was much lower, and then oxygen saturation is higher, and then dysphonia did not occur during eccentric cycling at all. However, eccentric cycling induced greater improvement of the six minutes walking test distance, and also uh, time at the go test improved better, and then ascending and descending stair walking ability improved better for the uh, eccentric cycling group, and also the leg strength improved better for the eccentric cycling group than concentric, and then lower limb free fat mass increase only for the eccentric cycling group. So easy exercise can induce greater effects. And also QOL and the very being uh, improved better for the eccentric training group than concentric training group. So this is a, a contralateral effect of the eccentric training. Uh, you have an injury and the leg is immobilized like this, then three to four weeks later, you can see massive atrophy and strength loss. And it takes long time to recover from this kind of state. But we can do training for this healthy leg. And especially if we are doing eccentric training for the healthy leg, we can minimize atrophy and strength loss for this immobilized leg. So this was due to greater cross transfer effect by eccentric training than concentric. This study showed that eccentric contractions provide greater stimulus for the cross transfer of the motor performance than concentric contractions. So we did a study for arm muscles. So participants were immobilized for four weeks, eight hours a day. They can take off their cast when they are uh, sleeping or taking a shower or driving a car. Then they did training with this non-immobilized arm 
three times a week for four weeks. So one group did concentric and eccentric contraction. And the other group did eccentric only contraction. Then uh, investigator helped to lift the dumbbell. As you can see, much heavier weight for the eccentric than concentric. We match the total work between the two training conditions. As you can see here, by mobilization, uh, arm circumference decreased about 28%, hand strength decreased about 22%. But for this trained arm, showed much greater improvement of the strengths for the eccentric only training group than concentric eccentric training group. And also hypertrophy was seen more for the eccentric only than concentric and eccentric. The, interestingly, for the eccentric uh, only training showed increase in strength for the immobilized arm, but no uh, increase, but maybe uh, no decrease of either for the concentric and eccentric. And uh, atrophy is much attenuated by eccentric and concentric training. So this study showed that including eccentric training, especially eccentric only training for the non-immerse arm can prevent atrophy and strength loss of the immobilized arm. So this can be applied for stroke patients. So general rehabilitation strategy is constraint in this movement therapy, but we are thinking about doing eccentric training for the uh, healthy arm could improve the uh, um, muscle function and strength of the impaired arm. This is still ongoing study. So just summarize. One negative aspect of eccentric exercise is delayed onset muscle soreness and prolonged loss of muscle function. However, muscle damage can be minimized by using preconditioning effect or gradually increase the intensity volume. So muscle damage is not necessary for any adaptation, muscle adaptation, not no pain, no gain. However, eccentric exercise has many positive aspects. It is less metabolic demand, but can increase muscle function, muscle mass, muscle coordination, balance, flexibility more, and also bone mineral density, insulin sensitivity, blood lipid profile, cardiovascular function, and the brain health can be improved. So we need to use these positive aspects of eccentric exercise more. So I'm in the process of developing an eccentric only gym. When they come to this gym, everything is more eccentric. Then we are applying this eccentric only training for patients to athletes. I hope that the aspect I can also have eccentric only gym in the future. So I like this quote. So this Nobel Prize winner in 1950, Bertrand Russell, stated that, do not fear to be eccentric in your opinion. For every opinion now, was once eccentric. Very nice quote. I would like to say, becoming eccentric, do not fear to perform eccentric exercises, which are the best exercise medicine and training intervention for all. Also, it could be a very nice rehabilitation strategy as well. So thank you very much for your attention.